This week, Freddie Fonseca, author of The Bomb That Blew Up God and other serious poems, talks about knowing when a poem is finished. Your poem is, according to me, never finished. I read it, I reread it, and I let it sink in. And at some point, I just feel, hmm, right now, I really wouldn't know how I could do it any better. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me is my mother and co-host, Caroline Coburn. And hello, everyone. It's another beautiful day in Iowa, a little humid, but you know, you know what? It makes the corn grow. So they say, <laughs> so they say. <laughs> so um, what are we, what are we talking about today? Well, we have a most interesting uh, guest today and his a book of poems. And the, the title of the book is The Bomb That Blew Up God and Other Serious Poems by Freddie Niagara, <clears throat> excuse me, Fonseca, Fonseca, right? Did I get that right? Yeah, that's correct. Fonseca, okay. And I was just uh, really impressed uh, with these with these poems. Um, you know, I just, uh, well... They just say they just say so much, and there's 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 a big variety of poems, a big variety of of uh, it's it's in the book is divided into um, different sections. Uh, Shards of light is the first one, and then dances, music, and magic, and the bomb that blew up God is the third section. Then vignettes is the that next one. Do we really die? Uh, some interesting ones in there. Strange renewal and a new dawn, and I, I I don't know just how did you how long did how long did it take you to write all these poems, Freddie? Uh, huh. Well, you know, uh, a lot of the poems in there are are really old, so it's kind of my life's work. So okay. I started writing in '69. So there are there are some poems from the early period. Many of the middle period, so you say, and some fairly recent also. So, when uh, did you start writing poems? Like, what age were you? Did you do this as a child and just kept going? No, not at all. When I was young and then in school, I didn't care for poetry. I can't say I hated it, but I didn't care for it. And uh, in school, it didn't turn me on. But then um, after school, by chance, I I, I found some anthology. I thought, oh, oh, this is nice. I didn't know that poetry could be nice. <laughs> and uh, so, but then I didn't, I wasn't taking any action uh, yet. But in 1969, when I was 29 years old, so you can figure out how old I am now, <laughs> I was living in Rome. And um, at one point, a friend of mine from uh, New York, New York City, came over. Uh, to play in films as an actor. And uh, I showed up the city a little bit, and there was this um, beautiful uh, Borghese Park in Rome. And we went there, and uh, we hit on a statue of Lord Byron. And on the pedestal, uh, there was a, uh, there was a verse of, of, one of one of his famous poems. And I read that, and I'll read it to you uh, real quickly. But I have lived and have not lived in vain. My mind may lose its force, my blood its fire, and my frame perish even in conquering pain. But there is that within me which shall tire, torture, and time, and breathe when I expire. And believe it or not, the next day I started writing poems in English, which is my second language. Well, you know, when when maybe maybe this is true of you too, Freddie. When I was younger and in, in right, right reading poetry, it seemed like everything had to rhyme. You know, like the first and third line had to rhyme at the last word. But that's not necessarily true. And and in, in Lord Byron's poem, it wasn't. So maybe that's what inspired you that you realize that yeah, it doesn't ever have to rhyme. It just has to mean something. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I'm after always. That it, just, it should mean something, something really big, something universal, if anywhere possible, mm -hmm. and something intelligible. 
That's that true. <laughs> that's yes, that yes, exactly. For the for the reader to be able to, that's to that's understand. That's yeah, you need to understand it or at least get a glimmer of understanding from first reading and if not, from the second. But not, you don't need it 50 times. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right. Uh, when, you, when you read it the 50th time, it should be so enjoyable that you're almost going to explode for joy. <laughs> but that usually doesn't happen. <laughs> so um, you said you, that English was your second language and what was your first? Dutch. Dutch. And you were born in? Curaçao, that is in South America. Okay. And you Curaçao. were living in, how did you get to Rome? Oh, well, I very much liked um, opera. And uh, when I was, before I went to Rome, I was very much interested in opera. So I heard a lot of Italian opera. And I found the language so beautiful. And I visited it, Italy a few times. And the last time I visited, I, I went to Rome. And I thought, oh, my God, this city is so beautiful. I want to live here for the rest of my life. <laughs> so I saved up some money, and I took some courses in Italian, which I already was doing, but some more in-depth uh, uh, courses. And I just went to Italy, and I, I tried to survive there. And uh, not knowing that I was going to write poetry, but I just went for the language and for the country. Okay, and how long did you live there? Obviously not the rest of your Actually, life because that, you're now in Fairfield, Iowa. Right, I didn't live that long there, six months. Mm -hmm. And I visited afterwards a few times also. But that that first uh, uh, Byron poem, that, that was enough. I was hooked on, on writing poetry. Wow. And then my friend from the one, the, the, the actor, he uh, introduced me to especially American poetry, which I knew nothing about at that time. I read some British poems and German and Dutch and Italian. Actually, I've read in something like five languages. But uh, American poetry was, was a new horizon for me. So, and I, indeed, then I started reading, uh, you know, like every day there was a, a, a huge library in Rome. Uh, the American Library, I believe, was the name. And I went there every day. And I was mainly reading uh, all of the, the American poets that I could find at the time. What brought you to the United States? Oh, uh, MIU, my, the Marichi International University. I wanted to study literature at that time. And you've been here ever since? Uh, I've been here ever since. Wow. So, but you're, you, your poems, you're covering the whole world in here, it seems like. Um, a lot of, like, South American poems. There's um, Antarctica. There's, they're really from all over. Have you been to all these places that you've written about? Oh, I've been to several. I mean, I've traveled, obviously, in the United States, but also in South America and in Europe. And you, as you know, Europe, there are a lot of countries there. And I... I went to many of them, and uh, I went there to museums, and I just drank in the, the culture wherever I was. And, uh, you know, I know that it has kind of shaped my writing in many ways, uh, although I haven't been to all those countries that are mentioned in the book or, or cities, but my muse tells me where to go, and then, you know, I have to obey. <laughs> So you travel in real life or you travel on the page. Yeah, and there are even poems that are actually about the Milky Way and uh, black holes. So I travel beyond the earth as well. How do you decide what you're going to write about? Uh, well, I do not really decide. Um, at some point, uh, I feel something brewing. I get some inspiration of something. It could be anything, else, of course. And then it usually... Uh, uh, sentence forms and it has a certain rhythm and a certain meaning and I fairly soon I kind of feel that this might be something or it might go nowhere but then the muse tells the poem how the poem wants to be written and it can be at one time it can be in, 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 in rhyme it can be a short poem, or it can be more like an epic poem, a long poem, or in free verse, or whatever. 
and then I follow that lead as much as I can, and then it, it writes itself. I do a lot of editing. It's not so that I uh, write a poem once and it is done. A few poems I've done very little editing, but most of them I have edited through the years. Every now and then I would, after a few years, I would maybe look at look again at a certain poem, and I think, hmm, wait a second, this phrase could be better if I do it like this, and not like that. Mm-hmm. And so, I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you that, if you if you rewrite very often, you know. Yeah, but, I do. Uh, actually, that is, it is much fun, because every time that you rewrite it, actually, you find a, a, maybe a word or a phrase that is a lot better than the, the previous one, and that gives you more of the meaning, and that really is very exalting for myself. It is this kind of a joy. And actually, the poem is, according to me, never finished. Well, but, that was what I was going to ask. When do you know when it's done, when it's finished? Uh, at some point, I feel a certain um, satisfaction or contentment about it. And I read, uh, read it, I reread it, and I let it sink in. And at some point, I just feel, hmm, yeah, well, right now, I really know, wouldn't know how I could do it any better. So that's what it is right now. <laughs> and do you wait until you reach that point before you publish the poem? Uh, yeah, generally, I do, yeah. yeah. So, But in the past, I've, I've uh, published several poems in, in uh, magazines and on that. And, but um, they're all, most of them are in the book. But when I looked at it, at them again, I have changed a few things here and there, just tweaking, you know, and uh, to make it just a tad better. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Freddie Niagara Fonseca, and his book is The Bomb That Blew Up God and Other Serious Poems. Mom? I was just going to ask you if this was his first book, or his first anthology, or if he had other other ones before this. I did an antal- anthology uh, 10 years ago in 2010. It's called This Enduring Gift. And it was a compilation of uh, 76 poets who live or at any time in their lives have, have lived in Fairfield. So, um, oh. And we uh, spoke with you about that poem back then, or about that book then, I believe. Yeah, we yeah. did. Mm-hmm. So, I'm, but then this is my second book, and this is just poems of, of, of me, not, not anybody else. Mm-hmm. What inspired you to put this book together? Well, something like three years ago, three years ago, I really started working on it. And uh, after actually a silence, believe it or not, of almost seven years where I didn't do anything, <laughs> I didn't do much. I mean, I worked, I lived, and and ate, and drank, (laughs) but not so much poetry. And then at some point I thought, yeah, I always wanted to have, of course, uh, a significant book of poetry, Uh, and I better hurry, because I'm not a spring chicken anymore. So, and then I I really (laughs) went to to work on it. And I was, at that time, practically writing every day and I edited and re-edited and shared with friends for uh, three years and I, I listened to the feedback that they gave me and they, they were not saying oh you should do right this but it would probably say something like oh this stanza doesn't really work or that one is really nice and then I would go back and see well why doesn't it sound so good with that particular stanza and I usually would find the reason why, and then I would just just uh, rewrite and then and, and tweak it, and uh, that went on for three years, and then and suddenly I, I thought, well, now we're going to do it. So, how many poems are in this book? It's about one hundred and thirteen, but actually a little bit more because I have on one page I have put a few haiku together, maybe like five or six and counted them as one poem, because otherwise <clears throat> the uh, the book was already uh, quite thick. I mean, it is like 100, officially 181 pages, but then you have, of course, the front matter, too. 
and um, so I try to to minimize things a little bit. But there's, there's 113 to maybe 120 poems, something like that. And I'm assuming this is a subset of all the poems you've ever written. Do you have any idea how many you've written in your life? Oh, um, well, probably around 300 or something. Some of them are lost. Uh, <laughs> With moves, you know, you move mm-hmm. on. Or, or new computers and you, I mean, yeah, I have things true. on on those old floppy disks. How do you ever recover that? <laughs> yeah, things like that have happened. And also, you know, in the time that you that I was writing longhand, that I had these huge stacks of paper with drafts, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, sometimes something got lost and it has gone. Yeah. Um, how did you decide which poems would go in this book? Uh, so at some point I had the pretty nice collection all together and then I discovered that um, that I could divide them in, in seven in, in chapters. At that time I didn't know it was going to be seven, but that though each of those chapters were of a certain subset of poems that I found belong together or go well together and put it that way. And uh, so I did that. And then I put them in an order, which I found, you know, that would best uh, um, work work best. And um, that's that's about it. <laughs> it's actually very simple. So tell us a little bit about how the book is organized. Well, it's an organized in, in, in seven uh, chapters. And the first one is, is called Shards of Light. And actually, I, I, I wrote... Uh, what is it called? Um, a synopsis, and I'll, I'll, I'll read you something from it. So chapter one, which is called Shards of Light, uh, in the synopsis I say, Shards of Light begins in an uncertain universe of random smatterings of light on the verge of spiritual darkness. The poem in this chapter are mostly introspective, set in colorful locales on the globe, and vast realms of the soul. Amidst all of this, we also find lighter content related to a growing awareness of light. So each of those chapters, I wrote a few few paragraphs, uh, sentences about, about them, on, and that goes, goes on and on. And then every every chapter, the mood uh, totally changes, and, and, and the energy. On the... the, the the last chapter is called The New Dawn. There I say, A New Dawn. The last chapter showcases poetry exclusively set in the natural world and how we, resp- how we respond to it. Here we take in nature at its most beautiful, epic, and uplifting. We witness the grand cycle, cycles of the universe turning. In a number of poems, we experience a measure of contentment, understanding, and appreciation of our existence. So that's the gamut of the whole book. Now, some of the most fun poems um, are very rhythmic. Uh, yeah, most of those <laughs> are in chapter two, but they're kind of uh, sprinkled in, in almost each of them. There's always something that is... Uh, very rhythmic and very energetic. Uh, so you want me to read one? Yes, I'd like you to read one of the, uh, from, is it Dances, Music, Magic? Yeah. Chapter? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's see what I'm going to read today. Uh, <clears throat> well, let me uh, read with a tango. Let's start with a tango. Tango in Buenos Aires. A touch of Argentina. Ah. Oh. Sweeping dresses, blinking eyes, supple, rhythmical steps, and quite unexpected turns. A lot of space, and there's the tango on a hot, tropical night in a sultry ballroom in steamy Buenos Aires. The blood is even hotter. Oh, 
deftly the dancers glide on a saucy rhythmical tune glancing at one another again and again while humming tangles on hot tropical nights where the moon sees everything in steamy buenos aires some of the lovers even sneak into the gardens before a tango is over the rhythm goes on yet the moon will keep silent ah but that's how tangos are danced on hot tropical nights in the shadowy gardens of steamy saucy sultry buenos aires <laughs> and have you visited buenos aires no, I haven't. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I thought surely you had. Uh, me too. Uh, me too. Yeah, I just, just watched the tango and, uh, well, yeah, and this idea. Actually, this poem was the very first dance and music poem that I ever wrote. So as you, as you can see, there were several in the book, and there's actually some that I have, that I am going to put in my second book. And, but this was the very first one. And I, I didn't have to change much about it. I just wrote itself and uh, maybe a, a tweet here or there, and it was it was, it was real fun. And I've uh, performed it many, many, many times also <laughs> uh, with, with music. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> Freddie, tell us about Billy Belly's Boston Big Brass Band. <laughs> That's right. Well, uh, I love brass bands. Probably most kids or a lot of people like the time when they like brass bands, you know, all those sounds and all the colors of the, the costumes and everything. Uh, and um, at one point I felt this, this energy of brass bands was kind of resonating in me. And I thought, oh, gee, it seems that, <laughs> that I need to write read a poem about brass bands and with that desire i actually first started looking at, at brass bands from a more you know i would say you know scientific <laughs> viewpoint other than my experience of what i had seen to make sure that if whatever facts i would put in that they would be correct and i mean not pure fiction so i read up a little about it about the the, the phenomenon of brass bands and its history and then, in the meantime, all kinds of ideas were coming up uh, about the poem, and I started jotting them down, and at some point I put it all together. <laughs> and it's written to be read aloud by a group, is that? Uh, well, it could be, but that was not my goal, so to speak. Oh, but okay. It, it okay. Could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, uh, it says it's a nostalgic divertimento in four episodes for narrator, brass band, chorus, and merry audience. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, mm. and I can, and uh, you have like stage directions. To yeah. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> so this is, I've never seen a poem written this way. Is this yeah. something that, that you've seen others do, or was this your own creation? Mm, well, I, I, I am indebted a little bit to uh, the poet Rachel Lindsay, who was a poem from Springfield, Illinois, who had written, uh, he lived in the first part of the 20th century and, until maybe, I think he died in the, in the 40s or something, or maybe the 50s. And he wrote a lot of, of, of poems about sounds, the, the sounds of America, of cars, of trains, and music. And I really like him, and I've read a lot of him. And some of it spilled over in in, in what, what I wrote in, in Billy Bally's Boston Big Brass Band. But I've never seen anywhere a poem uh, about brass bands in the first place, but also handled like I, I have. Uh, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I haven't seen it. And I've really read a lot of poems. So this is this is quite a long poem, but could you read a stanza or two so we can get a feel for the rhythm? Uh, okay, yeah. So let me read from read from the from the second stanza, the second episode, which is uh, called uh, Adolescence, 
in the streets and squares of Boston. That's the locale. Tara Rabumdie, what is going on today? We are out to see my favorite band in Boston. Friendly sunlight has been beaming, gleaming everywhere, brightening every glistening valve and valve and piston, every shining surface all around the sunny square. Everyone is glad today. Everyone is here today. Tarara, tarara boom die. Never, never leave us, Billy. Oh, we'll step along with you forever. Any Sunday down the streets and squares of Boston. Tarara boom die. Billy's band is great today. Billy in his towering bearskin shako, silver buttons, sash, and gold striped pantaloons, emblems, buckle, buckle belt, and bulging jacket, starts parading with his bandsmen Sunday afternoon. All the flags are out today. All the world is great today. Tarara, tarara, boom, die. Never, never leave us, Billy. Oh, we'll march along with you forever. Any Sunday down the streets and squares of Boston. Tarara, boom, die. Let us sing and dance today. Bandstand chorus members sing of stars and glory. All of us embrace the grandeur of the themes. Overtures and marches speak of untold epic stories. All become one nation sharing lofty dreams. Let us celebrate today. Let us all unite today. Tarara, tarara, boom, die. Never, never leave us, Billy. Oh, we'll sing along with you forever. Any Sunday down the streets and squares of Boston. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and that was our guest, Freddie Fonseca, reading from one of the poems in The Bomb That Blew Up God and other serious poems. So let's talk about your title poem. Yes, yes. Yeah, well... <laughs> The title poem is for some people provocative, for some people it's different. But actually, this is only a fable. It's a fable of uh, our condition, so to speak, um, and how we, uh, yeah, do not always follow God's ways. Uh, we think we're going to do something else. And that's so, so one day the, this, this uh, voice came up. Uh, let me see where it is. Yeah. Um, and, and the first line is, the devil insisted on having the latest, baddest bombs tested, that God wasn't thrilled. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the, the sub-line is, it's a fable, and it is the true history of the Big Bang, which is, of course, is a joke. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so I had uh, written that and uh, actually put it aside for a long time. And at some point, I returned to it and I showed it to a few people. And I said, oh, God, you need to publish that one. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so I tweaked it a little bit more and so on and uh, thought, oh, yeah, okay, that's going to go then in in Chapter 3. Uh, because chapter two is all about yeah conflict and uh, adversity and how man tries to overcome adversity. That's in chapter three. And then I uh, thought, yeah, well, maybe you can use it as the title. So yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Were there other runners up for the title? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have them anymore, but uh, some of them were yeah quite quite <laughs> wacky and so and. Uh, and some of them were just too peaceful, you know. And since the, there are so many poems in this in this book that have a certain character, and it is actually impossible to to make one statement for the whole book because there's just uh, there's so many directions that that the the poems are going. So and that's when I thought, well, maybe then we should have lift one poem out of there and group the rest around it. And, you know, I chose this. So, Mom, what were some of your favorite poems in the book? Well, the one that really, I would, you know, I, I would read something and I would 
a couple of pages, and, and I came upon this one on page 110, Nocturnal Squeaks, because <laughs> talking about a house squeaking at night, and my house makes noises all the time. <laughs> and it took it took me quite a while to get used to it, and uh, I'm still not completely used to it. But <laughs> this poem just really spoke to me, and uh, and I'm sure that I'm sure that there's if anybody who reads this book, there is a poem in here that will speak to them. I have no doubt about it. Yeah, I have found that several people have bought my book so far. It's, it's so thank you a lot of books. <laughs> it's quite amusing. And some some people have mentioned oh this one or that one. And often it was a little bit to my surprise because, of course, I have my favorites, and I'm always hoping that they will say that. Oh, I like that. Some of them do, but then others say something that. Oh, oh, good. I'm, well, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are what are your favorites, Freddie? Why don't you read? Why don't you read us one of your favorites? Okay, my absolute favorite is my poem, my poem about trees, and I read that very often with us because, yeah, for me, it's, it's, everything is in there, uh, and, but then there's others, you know. Okay, I'm gonna read it. The language of trees. I asked the trees one summer what they had been thinking of all year. They wouldn't say. But then I heard them wave and whisper of the ages, seasons, years and months and days, and countless hours of abundant happiness. I like the tales they tell me. Autumn makes them talk of leaving all, and yet they stay. And as they drop their leaves, they muse for weeks on April, Thrushes, stars and lingering Indian summers, rain and latent loneliness. Their voice is low in winter. Snow and icy winds are on their minds, and they withdraw. But in their winter dreams, you hear how branches sing and think of dawn. The sun, the sun in distant countries, warmth and summer peacefulness. How grand they are each season. Often have I seen them stand like kings. A certain awe surrounds their splendid forms. And so they wait for spring, for flowers, verdant prairies, butterflies in May, and simple loveliness. And then they speak of lovers. Sudden colors spread their message fast. And every year the many stories bloom and brighten noble pages, poems, gorgeous music, heart and mind with endless youthfulness. And so we welcome summer. All day long they stand and think and dream. And all we hear is how they wave again and whisper of the ages, seasons, years and months and days and countless hours of unending happiness. Freddie, trees are, are a fairly common subject for your poems, aren't they? Yeah, I've read, I've written several about trees. <laughs> they also creep in other poems of mine. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking here. There's one about sequoias, and there's one about the trees of your childhood. Right, right, right. And those are all in the in the, in the last chapter, a new drama. And you mentioned that um, <clears throat> when you were writing about the brass band that you researched when you had the idea of writing a poem about it that you started to research are there other topics that you've researched so that you could yeah, ground I, the poem yeah. in reality right, right. Um, when I, for instance when I wrote the, the uh, giant sequoia uh, you know I've seen I, I've never been to the, I've never seen a giant sequoia in the first place 
But uh, of course, I've seen them on TV and, and, and read about them in books and this and that. And I heard a lot of reports from people who have been there. And, and then university people say they are in total awe when they when they are among those trees. And that 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 sense what Dave told me that actually prompted uh, me to write a poem about it. But as I said, since I'd, I had never been there and I only knew spotily what they were and this and that. Uh, I I thought it would be wise to to read up about it and then and, and, uh, so I for instance then I found what the, uh, the the Latin name of it is and and then decided to to use that in the poem as well and then that poem is really a hymn to to the giant sequoia and also towards our condition, uh, the human condition, how we aspire to to become better and and and, and to to live a good life and, and and all that kind of thing. So that's all interweaven with, with, in the poem. I write about the poem, but actually we write about ourselves. Aha! <laughs> now the truth yeah. comes out. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Freddie Niagara Fonseca, poet and author of The Bomb That Blew Up God. So there's quite a variety of poetic structures included in here. Do you intentionally experiment with different structures? Like do you sit out and say, okay, I'm going to write a sonnet, I'm going to write a um, I'm going to try haiku. I'm going to try, I don't even know the names of all of them. Some of them are very formal and some of them are very informal. Have you tried them all? Uh, not all. I mean, I'm sure there are forms in there uh, uh, that exist that I have not never written about. But no, I do not intend to write a sonnet. I do not think I'm going to write it, write it in rhyme. No, there's nothing like that. As I said earlier, my muse, or the muse, tells the poem how the poem wants to be written. So, and then I follow that lead. And so one time it is, yeah, it's it, it, it maybe it's very formal, very grand. Another time it is like playful, but uh, the, the poem tells me, yeah, this is how I want to be seen. <laughs> this is how I want to be heard. And are so, there some that end up being like some of the um, forms that are very uh, restrictive? You know, that require a certain po uh, rhyming structure, a certain number of syllables per line. Uh, what is the question? Oh, are any of, do any of your poems, do they end up being, you know, fitting any of those particular structures? Yeah, yeah. So, so there, uh, I haven't counted how many, but there are several that are, are, are rhymed, almost like in the old days. But if you read them, actually find out that it is not quite like they did it, but anyway, they rhyme, okay, and they have a certain rhythm. And uh, some of them do not. And, and with, with other poems, I sprinkle a rhyme inside of stanzas of a poem that is totally in free verse. Uh, so you never, you, don't, you never know what is, what is going to happen. Uh, so you start reading and you think, oh, this is all uh, free verses and that, and suddenly there is an an, a, a sprinkling of rhyme in there, and then it goes back to not being in rhyme. It's always written. So, so that kind of thing that happens happens a lot. Yeah? So I think that the gamut is, is from strict rhyme to to whatever you want, but then um, with variations. And uh, so that there was an I would say that I intended to be uh, varied. But it is just my nature that I want to write in different styles. And, uh, why why restrict yourself to just three verse of just just this? You know why whether all those other forms exist? Uh, you know why why not use them? And I think that my um, having read in five languages poetry that is, I've been uh, exposed to you know other ways of writing poems than just purely in English or American. And I guess that, that some of that uh, found a way into to how I write. Mm. And have you written poems in other languages? 
Uh, yes, but none of them were uh, of the stature of what I'm doing now. Actually, the interesting thing was when I, I lived in Germany for a while, a year and a half or something, and uh, and I spoke, I speak the, the language fairly well, I can chat and this and that. <clears throat> and uh, a few times I was was dreaming in German and, and poems came in German. And I I don't always remember when I'm waking up, but it, they 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 came in German and and they sounded beautiful. Oh. <laughs> uh, but I uh, haven't written much of those down, and I certainly do not have them anymore. It must be really challenging to translate poems into a different language to be able to maintain the meaning and the rhythm, and if there's rhyme, the rhyme. It would seem almost impossible to do. Yeah, that is true. So usually when I read a translation of other poems, you always need to be a little bit suspect because you don't know the person who translated, how much does he does he or she know those two languages, you know. And it is this indeed you can you cannot it's very difficult to get the same sense of what the subject is. And and the music that is in the poem to have it in a different language. It is very rare, actually, that that translates well. The funny thing is that I've read uh, that famous poem by um, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, The Raven, in maybe five languages or something. And I've re- and I've read all those translations and put them next to each other, uh, next to the English one, of course. And actually. Uh, Two of them, I forget which language they were, it's been at least 40 years ago that I read them, were actually pretty good. And the other ones were kind of mediocre. But of course, the English one is, is, is superb. <laughs> but sometimes it, it works, but most of the time, I think it doesn't. There was another another one that I, that I really liked because one thing I, I love about nature is when I can see a Canada geese flying in the V V shape, you know, that they do. And and I, I read that the, the one out in front, uh, after a bit, then he drops back and lets the next guy take over so that he doesn't, the one in front doesn't get overtired because he has to honk the most in, <laughs> to keep them going. And the wild geese from Canada, this poem that you wrote, I, I really I really enjoyed that. Oh, I thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. You want to hear it? Sure. Let me see that. So I don't think. On page 122. 122. Okay. Yeah, that was kind of a joke, you know. (laughs) Okay. Wild geese from Canada. There's big cackling in the night. The geese have left their nests in Canada and pass our home, our route to Florida. I trust they'll find their goal all right. Nature leads them where to go. They formed a gaggling band and off they went. And now they fade and think they all will spend a winter minus all that snow. Autumn has been making giant strides. We have seen such early signs before. The cold will follow pretty soon and snow will bolt each little home on every side. Now, we are happy here and share, and if we can't remove the snow alone, we'll still be fine, for there's enough at home to feed us while we loaf and care. But if winter storms would cause us harm, we could decide to spread our arms and try to join those geese and leave to nature why she wants us where it's snug and warm. Something really weird is in the air. It's getting, I'm getting lighter, almost like a feather. Is something pulling me to better weather? Let's ask our feathered friends up there. (laughs) Here's the window, there the sky. We are taking off together, wing to wing. We are flying down to Florida to spring. Bye-bye now, Iowa. Goodbye to Florida. Florida. But what was that? I heard a chuckle coming from your mouth. 
You're cackling while you're flapping salt. Oh, are you not? Or are you nudging me, or what? There was a tapping on my shoulder. We are catching up now with our flock and kin, and should be hitting Florida by 9 a.m. Strange enough, it's getting colder. But hey, all is well that ends well. We are quickly heading down now for the landing, flapping closely just like geese of standing. But you are wiggling here like hell. Ah, oh, you're just tossing and turning tonight. We've been in bed to dream of warmer Florida, like gaggles flying by from good old Canada. We are staying home to snuggle up all right. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. Freddie, most of your poems have some humor in them. Do you have any in this book that are really serious? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for instance, the giant sequoia is a hymn, and it is totally serious. Okay. And, okay. <laughs> yeah. I I I just sometimes I just have to put something in, and it is. Uh... <laughs> well, you know, the giant sequoia and the other poems about tree remind me of that favorite little poem that everybody probably has heard. I think that I have never seen a poem as... I think that I will never see a poem as lovely as a tree. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Anybody know where that came from? Uh, it was written uh, by, I believe, a British poet in the 19th century. At the moment, I cannot think of his name. It's a fairly yeah. short poem, maybe... Mm, 15 lines or 16 lines or something. It's not a sonnet, but uh, it, is, it just goes A, A, B, B, C, C, R. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's a lovely poem. And it was very famous in its day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Joyce Kilmer, I just Googled it. And it was yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> you can Google that's, anything. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Freddie, did, did anyone ever put any of your poems to music, or did you ever? Put any of your poems to music? Well, actually, I performed with a local pianist and composer, Nathaniel Zumstein, and we we have very often uh, performed together with him playing on the piano. He's also a pianist and composer. And uh, he has this uncanny uh, capability of tuning in to the mood of the poem and how I read it. So sometimes when I... Reading, I'm reading a certain phrase out loud, and I do it maybe a little bit different than I did the last time. He catches up on it, and then he does something on the piano, which I cannot do, but he does. He can. And then it changes the dynamics, and then it inspires me to be even more expressive, and it inspires, then, it inspires him to do so. And then at some point, we are, you know, in, 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 in no man's land. We don't know where we're going. But it's total, it's total bliss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done that many, many times. <laughs> well, it does seem like some of your poems could become lyrics to songs. No, yeah, that is true. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but yeah. nobody has done anything. We have, we have performed uh, uh, several of those poems with him. And actually, I had been... I've been envisioning to do the grand opening, you know, when, when this book comes out, to uh, do a, a, a poetry co concert, a grand poetry concert and uh, book signing in Café Paradiso here in Fairfield. And I would like to do that with not only the, this pianist, but also with maybe five or six more instruments. And I, I have some ideas of which instruments would go with certain poems, and I would uh, introduce that to the musicians and see how they can handle it. Um, so, um, but since COVID is around, I have no idea when such a performance is going to take place. But yeah, sometime in the future. Freddie, have you have you written any poems about the pandemic? No, no, no. Actually, these were written. My my book was written before that. And uh, well, I know, but are you still writing? I assume. 
Yeah, but nothing has come up about the pandemic. But then I have to say, um, this desire to re- to write about current subjects to me is is always always dated because at some point that that problem is going to be over and then it is you know it doesn't matter that much. I rather write something that can hopefully be uh, appreciated uh, timelessly through the ages. So not this particular event or something in, in, in history, which might be interesting at the time, but 10 years later, huh, well, what was that about? It, it isn't of any interest anymore. And so I feel that poetry uh, is served best by uh, writing something that goes much deeper and more, more timeless. But that is my opinion, I should say. Mm-hmm. So, Freddie, let's talk about how you published this book. Okay, so it is printed. It's not quite yet published. It's going to be published on September 1st. But it's been published through First World Publishing. And this publishing company has, fortunately, all the content and stuff. But also, uh, I'm able to uh, buy copies from him at, at cost and then sell them. Uh, at uh, at the the list price or less. And so this publishing company is kind of a hybrid. Uh, So yeah, publishing companies, they they take care of everything. And on the other side of the fence, you you have the authors, they have their book printed, and that is then a book of uh, print on demand. But this publishing company just uh, melts these two things together. And I'm quite happy with that. Uh, And uh, I'm, I'm... you know, astounded how many <laughs> books I have sold. I'm not at all a millionaire yet. <laughs> but, so where uh, where can someone buy your book? On my website or uh, when they see me in the street. And what is your website? <laughs> um, actually, it is fonseca-poems.org. But if you look up just the title, The Bomb That Blew Up God, you will see it at the top of all the charts. <laughs> And um, once it comes out, it's formally published on September 1st, then right. readers yeah. would also be able to buy it on Amazon. And yeah, yeah. And it will be available, available actually worldwide because they, they can they can have it printed in, in, on all continents. Now, I understand you've had some, um, some great published reviews. Yeah, well, uh, Book Life, uh, together with uh, Publishers Weekly, wrote a wonderful review. Yeah, I'm very happy with that. That came in about two weeks ago. And how did you get the book in their hands? Well, I went to their website and and uh, looked at their uh, their guidelines and uh, so on, and I followed those and, and we looked at it. So Publisher Weekly did not review it. I, I hear that Publishers Weekly gets something like 10,000 poems a month. So Whoa. <laughs> that's a lot. So they passed me over for one reason or other. But then Book Life, who works together with them, but they have to make their own decisions, it seems. They decided to, 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 to take my work and look at it. And then they came up with this wonderful review. And what are some of the other ways that you're marketing and publicizing the book? Oh uh, well, I have my website, of course, and uh, I have a really a big mailing list, and so I've been writing to many people. I really uh, wrote forum letters with, with samples of my poems, or at least my uh, my web address. And I also have been very active on, on Facebook and uh, Instagram. And, you know, sometimes people that I didn't, have never talked about this, are, oh, I want your book. Well, okay, here it is. <laughs> now, I see on your website you have videos. Yes, yes. So what are, what are those? Oh, videos of some of my poems. Uh, is it like of times when you did readings, or is it like a, or is it a more... Um, produced video. No, that was from mostly from the times that I was uh, did readings. Yeah, so I, I I've always 
kept those, of course, and, and now they came in handy. Yeah. yeah. Several of those uh, recordings, some of them in audio and some are on video, and they are all on my website. Wow. Um, you said you're working on a second book? Uh, yeah, I have some, you know, <laughs> some some ideas. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Do you do any other types of writing other than poetry? Uh, actually not, no, no. So, I have at one time, you know, many, many years ago, I thought about a novel, and I think I started with a few pages, but I just felt, you know, that this is this is not, not what I can do. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I, I'm better writing as something more succinct as poetry, you know. I stuck to that. <laughs> Do you um, work with other poets at all? Oh, uh, what, what do you mean? Uh, well, like writing groups or... Oh, no, no, no. I've never, never been so enthusiastic about that, you know. We sit together and we criticize each other's poems. What is that do, you know? Uh, that doesn't work for me. I, I I understand that for some people it works extremely well, but I didn't feel like it. I have read a lot of, of, of poetry, um, and a, from from all ages and all eras, or and many of them, and um, that has been. Those have been my my my, my teachers. Uh, just reading and reading in, in several languages and uh, all kinds of poems. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so I'm um, you know, self-taught uh, and everything. Well, Freddie, we're about out of time, mm-hmm. and we're very glad to have had you here today. I want to mention again that you can buy Freddie's book, "The Bomb That Blew Up God." at fonseca-poems.org or just Google the bomb that blew up God because there probably aren't too many other things that will come up other than that. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I have one last poem that I'd like to read. Okay. So that is humorous, but it is also, well, I would say spiritual, but it is kind of what goes just about the the universe and you can... uh, find all kinds of things in there other than that it is a little humorous uh, and it is uh, called Black Hole. I used to go through life quite flat-footed. Back then, the sidewalk would stick to my heels, but I've grown up quite a bit, touching the stars way up here. Far below, there's Earth still kicking. My body It's being nebulous and probably stretching all over the Milky Way right now. My heart is somewhere in the middle, and it is awfully wide. In fact, there's a huge gap in my chest, and I'm breathing the universe in and out, night and day. A black hole is all that I really am, and I've dropped all contact with matter for sure. But hey, I am enjoying my space here immensely. (laughs) Thank you, Freddie. And Mom, do you have a closing quote for us today? It's uh, one that he had uh, in one of his poems, Almost Summer, and the the poem was from a Chuang Aizu. uh, Happiness is the absence of the striving for happiness. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a nice quote. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for being with us today, Freddie. Thank you, Mom, and see you all next week on Writers Voices.